Well, hello everybody. Before I give you a quick update, it's been a while since I've done a vlog. I've been quite busy doing a lot of storm chasing over the last week or so. Got caught up in a lot of editing, time lapse photography, and my website reports. Check out my web website, nightskyhunter.com. I have three storm chase image reports on there documenting those adventures. Great times, totally recalibrated the summer for me. As far as I'm concerned, the summer of 2020 is now back on full track and going well with good sky action. Um, just when I thought I couldn't get any better, we've got a nice uh, surprise having a new visitor in our skies. Excuse the noise, if you hear background creaking, that's the wind. There's very strong winds tonight in Northern Ireland and in the sunroom here the, the wood creaks overhead. But we have a bright comet visible in the sky at the moment. At last, after a very long wait for Northern Hemisphere observers, we have a decent comet. Uh, Atlas broke up on us, Swan uh, disintegrated as well and faded. Um, and Izon broke apart two years ago, so it seems every comet that has approached the Northern Hemisphere has uh, seems to have disintegrated or faded. But Comet Neowise is a different story. 2020 F3 Neowise. This comet has been visible uh, before this. We were aware of it. It's been uh, expected to become fairly bright, but nobody expected it to be really prominent. It's been visible in the Southern Hemisphere for some time, slowly brightening as it approaches the sun. But recently it has... Uh, captured on Soho images passing through the C3 coronagraph on the sun and it showed the comet surging in brilliance so much so that it generated a lot of speculation that we might get to see something post perihelion well that has happened now uh, over the last couple of days well yes, yes, yesterday in fact or the day before was perihelion passage and a comet was seen from the ground from quite a few locations and last night in fact, as I make this on the early hours of the 5th, many observers last seen it on the 4th and they reported seeing it uh, through binoculars quite readily, low on the, on the horizon and uh, with a magnitude somewhere in the order of 0 to minus 1. However, within the last 24 hours, it seems to fade it slightly to uh, between 0 and plus 2. Uh, that's still a bright comet. That's, that's very acceptable, quite quite amazing and the comet seems to be much brighter doing much brighter than anticipated and it's putting on quite a show for observers who have clear skies at the moment this comet uh, I can't wait to see it myself at the moment Northern Ireland we're suffering yet again from some real bad cloudy weather so I'm really going to be fighting for clear skies but I'm hoping my luck uh, changes soon and I'll get a chance to see this comet because I've been waiting a long time to see a decent comet uh, Neo Wise looks pretty impressive there are many uh, images doing the rounds now on social media. If you check out, uh, for example, spaceweather.com, uh, loads of images on there have been published and looking at some now here in the laptop. Some beautiful images taken by Michael Yeager, the, the famous uh, legendary comet astrophotographer. Uh, the comet is, looks very well condensed with a star-like central condensation and the looks of things there may be one or two tails involved here, certainly a fan-shaped Tail and what looks like a shadow of the nucleus effect. So you get the shadow cast along the actual tail itself. Uh, the comet is uh, difficult for for many reasons. It, well, it's an obvious object, but it's difficult to catch because it's very close to the sun in the morning sky at the minute. It's currently located in the constellation of Auriga, just below Auriga, and not far from the open cluster M37. It's moving to the east or left every single night. And as it does so, it will begin to gradually get slightly higher in the sky and away from the sun, eventually moving into the evening sky and being circumpolar for some locations. The comet, however, is very low. It will be obscured by uh, the thicker atmosphere close to the horizon, uh, hence the term atmospheric extinction. So uh, if you are making comet magnitude estimates, which are quite difficult because there's very few comparison stars at that, that altitude of the comet, then make sure to apply atmospheric extinction corrections. Uh, so at the moment it's raining here in Northern Ireland, it's pretty cloudy, there's a small chance of a few breaks before dawn, but I don't fancy my chances. We have 30, 40 mile an hour ones, and I may have to wait to the following night, which might be a little more promising, but we'll have to see. But anyway, I'm gonna make it my uh, life at the moment to capture this comet before it fades. The comet will fade gradually from night to night as it uh, recedes from the sun. However, it is still getting closer to the Earth. And it actually makes its closest approach to the Earth around about July 23rd. So even though the comet is fading, it is getting slightly closer and that may compensate somewhat for that fading. So even though it does fade, it won't be as abrupt 
as it normally would be if it was going away from the earth. So there's a possibility when the comet gets away from the vicinity of the sun uh, that it may actually become an impressive object. It should be naked eye. Some observers already have seen it in the naked eye. However, those are trained observers. But whenever it gets into the darker region of sky, um, it could be interesting. It certainly, especially with binoculars, there should be a prominent tail. We don't know what configuration the tail or tails may be yet, because nobody can predict such a thing, but that will become apparent in the days ahead. So at the minute, it's a very exciting prospect here. We have a bright, naked eye, proper comet, and uh, some of the images are absolutely spectacular from all over the world. Uh, there are lovely images taken through telescopes up close showing the coma and tail in, in sharp detail. There are a lot of other images which are very encouraging for amateur astrophotographers such as myself. And they were taken simply with telephoto lenses with one or two second exposures on a static tripod with no tracking. This is one of those rare chances to get a zoomed in. If you don't have the sophisticated gear, the, the big tracking mounts and instruments, this is a rare chance to catch a bright comet with a telephoto lens. Um, and be able to do so with quite reasonable uh, cheap gear so it's a very rare chance indeed but what, what will the comet do no one knows for sure it could fade rapidly it might not it could put on a quite a show the teal could become spectacular we'll find out on the, the days and um, maybe over the next week or so but uh, the comet see it now if you can um, to get it at its best but as it moves eastward, it should move from Uriga into Lynx and eventually into Ursa Major, the Great Bear, and when it becomes circumpolar. So it'll be quite easy to find in the sky if it holds its brightness. But uh, I'm just going to post a chart here as I'm talking. This is a chart from Sky and Telescope magazine showing that position of the comet. Here we go. So uh, I'm making this video in the early years of the 5th, so the comet on the 5th is very close to Messier 37, the open cluster uh, in Uriga. Of course that open cluster would be difficult to see because of the proximity to the sun. But as you can see it moves northward and eastward from night to night, moving several degrees per day. And uh, once it passes the 6th onwards it should become more prominent from the UK. It never reaches a great height however. Uh, this won't be a comet that's very well placed high in the sky and against a dark background. That will be the one of the main problems. But we'll just have to combat those uh, restrictions and see what we get. By the 15th, it's in crossing links. Then it enters Ursa Major approximately on the 18th and into the 19th of July. And the rest of July is spent passing through the paws of the Great Bears. We hope it'll still be a nice object then, even as it fades. It should be a nice binocular object and certainly uh, a very attractive prospect for astrophotography. So with that, um, I'll just leave a few images here. I'll share with you. Uh, I quite like this one taken. Uh, I got this off spaceweather.com by Oscar Martin, showing the comet with himself uh, as a selfie, with I assume as his partner or his wife. And you can see the tail moving off there to the to the north northwest, a straight dust tail with a hint of fanning structure on it. Even that simple steady shot there, it's a really cool composition there with the twilight sky. So yeah, you can see from this image that you really need to get a good horizon, a good northeast horizon, very low down before sunrise, and that's your best chance of seeing it. You, you need to avoid horizon obstructions. Another nice image. This was taken by the ISS, by the uh, one of the astronauts on board the ISS. You can see the uh, comet above the twilight arch there. There's actually NLCs visible in that image too. Another fantastic image here too from Space Weather from Arizona. And this one here, I can't pronounce this guy's name, because excuse me, it's a beauty of an image too. And of course the famous image by Michael Yeager, taken through, I believe, uh, a small telescope or a 600mm lens on a tracking mount. But, uh, absolutely brilliant and you can see that shadow of the nucleus effect very clearly there. Some observers are reporting the comet to be quite similar to but not. I know it was during the, uh, the sunset sky in 2007. Others are saying it's more like a smaller version of Pan Stars, L4 Pan Stars. Either way it's a nice comet, it's a nice treat. If you have clear skies make the most of it and enjoy the show and uh, hopefully I'll, a bit of luck I'll get to see it and observe it too and hope to get a few images to showcase on the website. So. I wish you the best of luck and clear skies. This is what I plan to use to image the comet, all being well. If it still holds its brightness, it's still large enough. 
I'm going to be using the uh, Canon 5D Mark IV and my Canon 100 to 400mm lens. And this is a great lens, very good optical quality. I use a lot for daytime imaging of the snow scenes, nature, landscapes, funnel clouds, that kind of thing. Although it is a slow lens. It's an f4.5 at its widest aperture, so it is quite slow. Uh, however, uh, the glass on it is very good, it's very sharp. But uh, the slow nature of the lens, I can compensate for that by quite a deal by the body of the 5D Mark IV. I can get away with high ISOs and very clean images, so it shouldn't be an issue at all. So I'll be able to get in fairly close, certainly to 400mm anyway, I'm assuming. And uh, get a short exposure. Choose the appropriate ISO, leave the aperture wide open, uh, cable release in there, and hopefully I'll get it. And uh, because of the high megapixel capabilities of this camera, I should be able to crop the image in a little bit closer to to show more detail. So that's the plan anyway. So if you're doing photography like this of the Comet, then uh, make sure you have a good tripod. Mine's is just average. This is just a makeshift tripod I bought in the meantime when I got this camera. And make sure your mount is good and solid, all the knobs are tight on the mount and focus on the comet using live view through the LCD screen. Uh, make sure your lens is on manual, make sure the uh, image stabilization is turned off and manual, manually focus on a bright star in the sky or a planet such as Venus or Capella or Vega for example. Make sure the images are nice point sharp stars and carefully reposition the the uh, camera to the towards the comet and allow for drift of the comet due to the Earth's rotation. You know, because if you have a tight field of view, it's not going to stay in it for too long before it rises. So just prepare for that by putting it at the edge of the field and let it drift in and then take your exposure. Uh, as for white balance, auto mode, you can auto white balance, you can change it later. Or, or if you want, you can use uh, tungsten, for example, if you've got an LP. But I would say just leave an auto in the meantime. And uh, you may want to use your two second timer or a 10 second timer to avoid vibration or just use a cable release that will minimize any vibration at all. And of course, keep your mirror locked up so avoid vibration from the mirror flipping. So your ISO will vary from anywhere, depending on how good your camera is, how good your lens is, how bright the sky is, anywhere from 100 to 400 or even 1600, just depends on the background sky. So you just have to bracket your exposures and find out what works. So it's pretty straightforward. The hard part really is to get that sharp focus for the long lens. So take your time doing that. And uh, hopefully your, your mount's good. So I'll find out on the days ahead how I get on. So wish me luck.